Um, so yeah, after uh, presenting a little bit of uh, the context of the fishery and uh, those uh, depredation levels, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, uh, biology side of the research we've been uh, conducting on those uh, kilo whale and sperm whale populations uh, of the Cruzi and the Kerguelen Island. Uh, that was actually a real need when facing such uh, high interaction rates uh, with those uh, populations. There was a great effort that was put into research on those populations and with a great collaboration between uh, the, 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 the ship owners, uh, the scientists and the manager. There was a collective study that were uh, conducted. Uh, this is how I was able to do a PhD on those uh, uh, different questions. And part of my PhD was about finding uh, how uh, demography and population structure may be uh, impacted by this new behavior for those whales, uh, pretty recent behavior, that is uh, depredation of the Crozet and the Kerguelen Island. I'm going to talk to you about mainly about the Crozet Island. This is how hotspot and also how uh, a case study uh, for studying those depredating populations. Uh, so, yeah, as I said earlier, um, the issue uh, with the two species mainly occur of the Crozet Islands, uh, sperm whales of the Kerguelen Islands. Uh, of the Crozet Island, we actually have two types of whales, and uh, this is what uh, uh, Professor Anelio has been talking about, those different types of whales. We're going to go further uh, in further details later on about that. But of the Crozet Islands, we have one type of whale that is kind of similar to the type A uh, uh, Antarctic uh, killer whales, I mean, in terms of uh, morphology. And we also have another type of whales uh, that are the type D whales. And both types do interact with the fisheries, with the Patagonian toothfish, uh, longline fisheries operating of the Crozet Islands. Um, so it's interesting to see that uh, we see the similar types of whales, the type D, which are uh, extremely rare uh, kilo whales that are also interacting uh, with the Chilean fisheries. Uh, that was the first surprise. Um, for both types, we've got uh, data, and especially photo identification data. Uh, the first one, the closet type kilo whales, have actually been monitored for quite a long time. Um, and this is because we also them we also see them from uh, the shoreline, uh, from the main islands of the Cruze archipelago. Uh, there have been photographs that have been taken uh, since 1964. So we've got a pretty long-term data set on photo identification of those whales. Uh, we have some whales that are still alive today, and they were first sighted uh, back in the 80s and back in the 70s. Uh, we've got actually a female that was first photographed in 1977. Um, so in 2014, uh, we estimated uh, that we had about 75 uh, individuals that were uh, observed on a very regular basis. That means uh, uh, we, uh, we see them pretty much every year. Uh, and those 74 uh, individuals would belong to 19 social groups. Uh, those groups are highly stable over time. Uh, they are composed in between three to six individuals. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, with such amount of data uh, from land and from fishing vessels, we uh, uh, are able to know who is the mom of who, uh, who what are the relationship between those individuals. Uh, so very powerful data set. And I forgot to mention that part of the data we get now, it actually a huge part of the data we get, uh, in addition to the land data, is from the fishing vessels. Uh, we've got uh, all the fishery observers are equipped with uh, uh, photo uh, gear, a camera, a big lens, and uh, uh, it's in their protocols. They have to collect uh, photo identification data from those vessels. So Nicholas is going to talk about that uh, in more details later. And for the type D whales, uh, we've seen them for the first time in 2003. That was the first sighting. Uh, it was actually one of the first sightings in the uh, Southern Ocean. Um, and, um, since then, uh, we were able to photograph about 30 individuals. And uh, what is interesting is that since 2009, those individuals are always the same. We've got uh, some uh, maybe resident uh, uh, kilo whales from the type D ecotype around the Crozet Island. Uh, in terms of distribution, uh, in blue, those are the uh, depredation events uh, with the crozet type kilo whales, so uh, they are much more interacting with the fishery than the type D kilo whales. 
uh, and they are pretty much everywhere around the Crozet Islands. Uh, for the Type D, it's uh, actually a kind of dist different story. Uh, we uh, see them in very offshore waters, uh, very far from the island, and only in the southwest part uh, of the archipelago. And when looking at the uh, fishing data, and uh, when combining this fishing data with the photo identification data set, uh, we were able to measure uh, the uh, relative uh, uh, probability of presence of one of the two types uh, during depredation events. And what we observed is that since 2003, at the very beginning, uh, it was only crozet type kiloware that was uh, interacting with the fisheries, but it's actually changing. The type D whales, and remember I told you that we are observing the same individuals over and over, are actually taking more and more uh, of this proportion of depredating longline sets. So the two types, they don't mix. Uh, they do interact uh, uh, separately with the fisheries, but uh, we kind of have uh, some kind of, yeah, interesting increase from the type D kilo whales. Those type D kilo whales, we actually don't know anything about those uh, whales. Uh, we don't know what they eat, what are their feeding ecology. But for the crozet whales, we know more. I'm going to talk to you about that later. And we started some preliminary analysis on the where do we see those type D kilo whales, and they were more likely to be uh, depredating on longline sets at very deep waters compared to the others that were, that were uh, closer to the island. So, talking about the crozet type, for which we have most of our uh, data, uh, this population of the crozet islands, it's actually quite interesting, because they uh, appear to have some kind of generalist feeding ecology. Um, it's um, kind of different than any other populations of killer whales in the world. Uh, killer whales are usually highly specialized into one type of prey, uh, of the Crozet Island, they are able to feed on pretty much everything. That is from large whales, pinnipeds, uh, penguins, and including fish. But what is interesting is that when the fishery started in the 1990s, um, only a part of the population started to interact with the fisheries. Uh, there were some groups uh, that we see from the island, for example, uh, they do mix, they do associate with other groups that we see from fishing vessels and also from the island, uh, but those groups uh, were never observed from fishing vessels. And actually, when looking at the interaction rate with fisheries for each group of killer whales, this is what you see at the bottom, uh, all the 30 different groups that we've been uh, photographing, uh, you could see that some groups are much more speci specialized into that new behavior. Uh, actually, we've got four groups of whales. It's about 15, 20 individuals that are responsible for more than 70% of all the interaction, uh, all the depredation events around the Crozet Islands. All the other groups that you see in the middle, uh, these groups, we see them from time to time, but they are doing some kind of uh, opportunistic depredation. Uh, it's, uh, uh, we see them yeah, at least two or three times a year, but no more. The other ones, the one on the left, they're actually seeking for vessels and looking for fishing vessels. They are observed pretty much everywhere. And this is what I'm saying. Uh, this group, the group uh, we call C18, uh, is interacting with fisheries on all fishing grounds uh, of the Crozet area. And this contrasts with other groups that are more localized in their depredation activity. Uh, and this is the case for this group that is uh, having a lower interaction rate. Uh, same thing in, in terms of seasonality. Some groups, they're going to interact with the fisheries all year round. And this is the case of this highly specialized group of depredation. And for other groups, uh, they're going to have some strong seasonality with periods of the year without any interactions. And we think those groups are still relying uh, heavily on natural prey resources such as the elephant seal. Uh, and uh, during some periods, some key periods where this resource is abundant, uh, those whales tend not to interact with the fisheries. So this is interesting uh, in terms of uh, ecology of the population of, of, uh, of the killer whales, but also in terms of management of the fisheries. That means during those periods, uh, it's possible that uh, some groups of killer whales are not going to be interested at all uh, into depredating on fishing vessels. 
What we've been looking at uh, are the consequences of interacting with the fisheries on those populations, and uh, I mean on the demography of uh, the populations. Uh, the question we ask is that given those intra-population specializations, those variations between groups, uh, are there effects on demography uh, parameters? And to do that, we started by looking at one parameter that is the survival of individuals that gives you an idea of the health of populations. And we divided our population into two groups, uh, the depredating killer whales and the non-depredating killer whales. And what we observed was actually interesting over a period of 30 years is that uh, before the fishery started, uh, both uh, groups, uh, I mean, of course, there was no fishery and we don't see any effects on survival for both depredating and non-depredating, it's high. But when the fishery started in the 1990s, uh, we see great decline for the whales that started to interact with the fisheries. And we think during that period, um, whales, they don't tell the difference between a legal and an illegal uh, fishing vessel, and there have been an amazing, hugely activity uh, of poaching for Patagonian toothfish during that period, and we know those illegal fishers uh, would get rid of killer whales when interacting with their long line by using fire guns and explosives. And we actually have an accurate idea of what were the consequences of uh, such uh, reaction from these uh, illegal fishers on the killer whale population. This population dropped by 50% in less than 15 years, and most of it is due uh, to uh, uh, lethal interactions with the illegal fisheries. When illegal fishing stopped, uh, we see the survival of those whales started to increase again. And they actually have now a better survival than the non depredating uh, killer whales. We think these uh, whales that never started to interact with the fisheries are more tightly related to the resource, uh, such as elephant seals or large whales, availability uh, in natural conditions. And we think this had an effect uh, during the 90s of the decline of the elephant seal population, uh, and we see the consequence of it on the survival of non-depredating individuals. In reproduction, we also detected a positive effect of depredating on fisheries. Uh, Depending on the level of interactions of those whales, uh, we had uh, females that had high interaction rate with the fisheries had better uh, probability of giving birth uh, to calves. So that was an extensive uh, study using uh, 10 years of data uh, and to assume possibly that uh, the artificial food provisioning they get from the fishery that is catching a fish that is already caught so they all don't have any energy to spend on chasing a prey item. The fish is there, depredation is an easy uh, food to get, and this, on, especially on top predators, had a direct effect on demographic parameters such as the reproduction. So that was our main assumption, that those whales are actually right now benefiting uh, from uh, depredation in terms of reproduction. Uh, we also looked at uh, the trends uh, for all those different groups of killer whales we have around across the islands. And what we observed is that some of the groups are actually habituating to uh, this new behavior of depredation. And this is actually the case for at least seven, eight groups that were never observed interacting with the fishery at the very beginning, but progressively are starting to interact more and more with the fisheries. And we also see some groups that are actually interacting less and less with the fishery. Um, some of them are transient. Uh, they uh, move from uh, one island to another. Some of them have been seen off the Mayan and Prince Islands. So that means they're going to visit the Crozet Islands for a short period of time, maybe uh, one year, and then leave the area for uh, several years. But there are also a few groups that on the graphs, you see they stopped interacting. That's because they disappeared. And we think, I mean, killer whales, they don't know the boundaries of uh, uh, French EZ in international waters. We know they move a lot. We got some matching of individuals between Mayan and Prince Edward and the Cruise Islands, which is about 1,000 kilometers away. Um, 
and we know there is still illegal fishing going on at the very periphery, uh, just outside the French EZ. It's possible that there is still some uh, lethal uh, reactions going on on those uh, kilowatts. So the population is not going so good, and partly because of those uh, lethal reactions from uh, illegal fishers. Uh, and this is more uh, recent work. Uh, this uh, is what we've done last year about uh, the sperm whale population. So for many years, since uh, 2003, we started to collect photo identification data. The main difference with killer whales is that we can identify, I mean, John talked about that for South Georgia this morning, um, with the features on the tail flukes, and uh, we had few students, I helped them a little bit, but we had to process lots of pictures uh, to be able to identify individuals. And total, I mean, including Cruze and the Kerguelen Island, because we also had a lot of pictures from there, uh, we could identify three, 305 individuals that are interacting with the fishery. Using this data, uh, the next step was to uh, look at some demographic features uh, for this population. And the first results we had over this 10 years period of time is that those whales, those sperm whales, are highly uh, localized in their uh, interactions. And we think they are moving, uh, migrating, and especially during the winter month in the Southern Ocean. Um, at these high latitudes, we only have big adult males. Uh, we think Crozet and Kerguelen are major fe feeding ground for them. Uh, and for the reproduction, they're going to move up to tropical and subtropical waters. But when they come back to those feeding grounds, uh, they come back to the same spot. And those spots are highly localized. Uh, actually, for the Crozet sperm whales, uh, we uh, saw that more than 75% of individuals remain within a 60 kilometers range uh, from their first sighting, first observation. And this is over periods of many years. Uh, just to give you an example here, uh, at the top you see one individual that was only sighted off the Crozet Island over a period of 2,273 days. And over that period, it's been observed uh, several times, and every time it was observed in this south area of the Cruz Island. Same thing in Kyrgyzstan. This guy, eight times, uh, it was sighted over uh, nearly 3,000 days, and every time within that period. So these guys, they do have their favorite uh, feeding ground uh, over the area, and this is also important in terms of managing uh, the, the, the fishery. We, I'll be talking later in terms of mitigation. And at the end, we also estimated the current state of that population of sperm whales, uh, about 80 individuals of the Crozet, about 100 of the Kerguelen. So that gives us an idea of how many individuals are actually benefiting uh, from depredation over these two areas. So yeah, I just want to finish by emphasizing the importance of those long-term monitoring uh, programs on whale populations and those extensive fishing data sets. I know several fisheries uh, do have similar data sets, but others are just starting, and that gives you an example on what can be done uh, from those photo identification data. All right, thank you.